Okay, let's talk about the intrinsic or fundamental value of a company, what a company is really worth. And if you believe in the strong form of the efficient markets hypothesis, you believe that the stock price reflects that true fundamental value. Okay, here's the concept of intrinsic value all in one graphic. We're going to calculate our free cash flow for the company. We're going to find the present value of it discounted at the weighted average cost of capital which is going to be the weighted average cost of our debt and our equity. And those are going to reflect market interest rates, market risk aversion, the debt equity mix of our company, and the company's business risk. That's a lot to digest. Let's break it down and let's just take a look at this part. The value, the intrinsic value of the company, is the present value of the future free cash flows discounted at the weighted average cost of capital. In other words, the present value of future cash flows. But what do we mean by present value? All right, let me tell you a story. Suppose my ex-brother-in-law owes me $100. And he comes to me and he says, I know I owe you $100. I can either give you that $100 today or a year from now. Which would you prefer? Well, even if I know he's going to have that $100 a year from now, I would like to have that money today so that I can invest it. Assuming I can invest it at 2% rate, a year from now, I'll have $102. The more interesting question would have been had he come to me and said, I know I owe you $100. I can give you $100 today or $100, $102 a year from now. Which would you prefer? Theoretically, those are the same amounts of money. If he gave me that $100 today, I would invest it and have $102 a year from now. Or I could just wait until a year from now and collect the $102 from him. So what we say is $102 is the future value of $100, or what we might say today is $100 is the present value of $102 to be received a year from now in a 2% market. And the algebra really isn't that complicated. The future value is equal to the present value times one plus the I, the interest rate, raised to the nth power, in this case one, because there's just one year. We can divide both sides of that equation by the 1 plus i to the nth and discover the formula for the present value of a lump sum, PV equals the future value divided by 1 plus i to the nth. We can also use the financial calculator to find the present value. We'll hit second FV to clear out the uh, memory in our third row. N is 1. We can put these in any order, by the way. Let's input them from left to right. 1n, what's the interest rate? 2. And what's the future value? 102. Let's change the sign on it because the financial calculator has a convention. If you put in positive numbers, it'll shoot you out a negative number. If you put in a negative number, it'll shoot out a positive number. Let's compute PV and sure enough, there's our $100. So hopefully now this thing makes a little bit more sense. This is our predicted free cash flow for year one. This is our factor to Bring it back to time zero, one plus weighted average cost of capital raised to the first power because it's one year out. This is our predicted free cash flow for the second year. To find its present value, we divide it by one plus the weighted average cost of capital raised to the second power because it's two years out. Well, what do we mean by the weighted average cost of capital? Our weighted average cost of capital is what our money costs us on the right hand side of the balance sheet. As an aside, we're only going to enter into new projects on the left-hand side, new stores, new warehouses, new factories, that earn more than what our money costs us on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. And we're going to have a cost for our debt issuance. That's pretty easily figured out because we have bonds out there that are being traded every day. And then we'll tax affect that because interest is tax deductible. If we have preferred stock out there, in the marketplace, it's being traded all the time, so we can figure out what new preferred stock would cost us. And the tricky part is going to be the common stock. We don't sell stock every day, and there's not any interest rate attached to it. So we're going to have to do some guesstimating to figure out what our common stockholder's required rate of return is, and we'll use that as our cost of capital. And what we'll do is we'll weight these rates. Maybe we've got an optimal mix of 50% bonds, 10% preferred stock, and 40% common stock. We'll weight those, and that'll give us our weighted average cost of capital, which is also our investor's required return. 
And speaking of our debt costing us less because interest is tax deductible, in finance, to get an after-tax number, we'll often use the shortcut of multiplying the pre-tax number times one minus the tax rate. We're doing in one step what you might do in two steps. For example, if a company had income before taxes of $100, we can multiply $100 times the tax rate of 30%. That would give us income taxes of 30, and then we would subtract 30 from 100 to get 70. Or we could simply take the shortcut of taking 100 times 1 minus 0.3, and that gives us the $70. All right, we're almost there. We now know what present value means. We now know what weighted average cost of capital means. We now know what these denominators here mean. These denominators, they're doing the present value work for us. We're just left with what the concept of free cash flow is. All right, so the first thing is that free cash flow is not defined by generally accepted accounting principles. So every different financial analyst may have a slightly different way to calculate free cash flow. The easiest way may be to look at a company's statement of cash flows and at the line for operating activities. Their cash provided by operating activities. In this case, it's 163, minus what they have to spend to maintain their fixed assets. I like to think of free cash flow as the money that's left after the company pays the operating bills, after they pay their taxes, and after they maintain their assets, short term and long term. How much cash is left to distribute, say, to the shareholders or the debt holders? But a more sophisticated way to calculate the free cash flow would be to begin with NOPAT, net or operating profit after taxes. In finance, sometimes we like to say, how would this company be doing if they didn't borrow any money? That way we can compare different companies with different amounts of debt on their balance sheets. So let's start with EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. In 2019, that was 400. We'll multiply it times one minus the tax rate, and that will assume that the tax rate is 0.25. So 0 0.75 times 400 gives us $300 of NOPAT. That's our cash in. Now let's figure out what our cash out is. How much do we have to spend on our assets, short term and long term? Hopefully you remember that networking capital is current assets minus current liabilities, but we're focusing on operations. So we're not gonna include the short term investments on the asset side or the notes payable on the liability side. We're gonna assume those are not related to operations. So when we ca calculate the net operating working capital, 1600 minus 600, gives us 1,000. But we're not just investing in current assets, like inventory, we're also investing in long-term operating assets. So let's take that $1,000 of net operating capital that was invested in our short-term assets and add to it the $2,000 that is invested in long-term assets. That gives us our net operating capital at the end of 2019 of 3,000. Now let's look at our total net operating capital from last year. If we did those same calculations, we discover it was 2490. And we'll look at our net operating capital for this year, which is 3000. That means during 2019, we must have invested 510. If our no our cash in was $300 and we spent 510 on our operating assets, we have free cash flow of minus 210. All right. Hopefully these things make a little bit more sense now. Our steps are, first, we'll make predictions about the future sales of the company going forward. Then we'll make predictions about future operating costs, subtract those costs from the sales revenue and multiply that number times one minus our tax rate. We'll ignore interest expense for now, but we will subtract required investments in operating capital, both current operating capital and long-term operating capital. That'll give us our free cash flow. We'll predict that for the next X years, and then we'll find the present value of those future cash flows at a discount rate of our weighted average cost of capital. In other words, what our money costs us on the right-hand side of the balance sheet and what our investors require. Once we find the present value of the estimated free cash flows for our company, we have the intrinsic value. 